Mastery is the goal. You want to set a goal that is big enough that in the process of achieving it, you become someone worth becoming. Jim Rohn, self-made millionaire, success coach, and philosopher. Of course, the ultimate benefit of overcoming these considerations, fears, and roadblocks is not the material rewards that you enjoy, but the personal development that you achieve in the process. Money, cars, houses, boats, attractive spouses, power, and fame can all be taken away, sometimes in the blink of an eye. But what can never be taken away is who you have become in the process of achieving your goal. To achieve a big goal, you are going to have to become a bigger person. You are going to have to develop new skills, new attitudes, and new capabilities. You're going to have to stretch yourself, and in so doing, you will be stretched forever. On October 20th, 1991, a devastating fire roared through the scenic hills above Oakland and Berkeley, California, igniting one building every 11 seconds for over 10 hours, completely destroying more than 3,700 homes and apartments. A friend of mine who is also an author lost everything he owned, including his entire library files full of research, and a nearly complete manuscript of a book he was writing. Though he was certainly devastated for a short period of time, he soon realized that although everything he owned was indeed lost in the fire, who he had become inside, everything he had learned and all the skills and self-confidence he had developed writing and promoting his books was all still inside of him and could never be burned up in a fire. You can lose the material things. But you can never lose your mastery, what you learn, and who you become in the process of achieving your goals. I believe that part of what we're on earth to do is to become masters of many skills. Christ was a spiritual master who turned water into wine, who healed people, who walked on water, and who calmed storms. He says that you and I, too, could do all these things and more. We definitely have that potential. Even today, in a town square in Germany stands a statue of Christ, its hands blown off during the intensive bombing of World War II. Though the townspeople could have restored the statue decades ago, they learned this more important lesson. Instead, placing a plaque underneath that reads, Christ hath no hands but yours. God needs our hands to complete His tasks on earth. But to become masters and do this great work, we all have to be willing to go through the considerations, fears, and roadblocks. The Power of a Goal Things do not happen. Things are made to happen. John F. Kennedy, the 35th President of the United States of America When I was conducting a workshop in Chennai, India, I had the great fortune to meet C.K. and Veena Kumaravel. Their story illustrates the awesome power of committing to a goal. When C.K. and Vina's children started attending school, Vina decided she wanted to do something to earn 60,000 rupees, $1,300 a month. Vina could have easily landed a job or stayed at home as a homemaker, but she was resolute in her desire to be self-employed. She knew she wanted to be her own boss, but she hadn't yet identified what she wanted to do. One of the techniques I teach that can help you decide what to do with your life is to think about what irritates or frustrates you. Then see whether you can create a livelihood there. If something is bothering you, chances are it's probably bothering others too. I simply suggested that Vina follow that age-old rule of business. Find a need and fill it. Vina realized she had long been irritated by the lack of good quality, affordable beauty salons where they lived. Attractive salons were found only in India's five-star hotels, and were both expensive and intimidating for most local people. At the other end of the spectrum were the local beauty parlors and barber shops with standards of hygiene that were far below par. Vina and C.K. soon realized there was a need for a quality, value-focused salon in Chennai that could serve both men and women. Having made the decision to start such a salon, the next challenge was to find skilled staff and managers. Vina was not a beautician, hairdresser, or makeup artist, and C.K. knew even less about the industry. They solved this first challenge by hiring the manager of the salon at the Taj, 
the leading five-star hotel in India, who then hired the rest of the staff. Their next challenge, usually the most critical faced by all first-generation entrepreneurs, was to find startup money. C.K. quickly approached what he calls the three F's, family, friends, and fools, and was able to collect enough to open their first Naturals Unisex Salon and Spa on Qatar Nawaz Khan Road in Chennai. Eventually, they achieved Veena's original monthly income goal of 60,000 rupees, and even opened a second salon. But they decided to think even bigger. By opening four more salons, Veena concluded they could turn Naturals into a salon chain. One after another, however, the bankers they met with said no. Taking their cue from the success principles, which taught that no means next, they asked again and again, until the 54th banker, impressed by this dedicated husband and wife team doing business together, said yes to their loan request of $130,000. With the addition of the new salons, the Naturals brand was visible and growing. This success inspired Vina and CK to franchise their business, so they advertised in two major newspapers, expecting 500 inquiries or more. When just 334 people responded, and only 32 filled out the preliminary paperwork, Vina and CK could identify no one who was actually serious about becoming a franchisee. At the time, beauty salons were considered taboo, and what's more, Naturals was not a big multinational brand. Their solution to the challenge? Find prospective franchisees who would co-invest and partner with Vina and CK on each salon location, providing a level of confidence for franchisees who would operate the salon. Soon, the Naturals chain nearly doubled to 13 locations from this winning formula of adding franchisees. By 2009, the chain had grown to 54 salons. And by 2014, there were 376 natural salons across India. Veena and CK also negotiated an agreement to open salons inside 250 Easy Day neighborhood stores and are on target to open 50 salons in the Gulf region, where millions of people from India live and work. What gives CK and Veena the greatest satisfaction is that they've created 184 financially successful women entrepreneurs. 80% of whom started out as stay-at-home housewives. Even more importantly, they have created 6,400 jobs. During one of my trips to Chennai, the Kuma Ravels invited me to attend the opening of one of their new salon spas. What an experience! The salon was clean, brightly lit, and very welcoming, as were all the staff, and the level of positive energy was unmistakable. But the thing that deeply moved me was that several of the staff were visually challenged. The Kuma Ravels had discovered that, due to their heightened sense of touch, these young men and women make the best foot reflexology and massage therapists. And now they employ a large number of these young men and women who would otherwise be relegated to a life of poverty and neglect. Read more about Vina and CK story at www.thesuccessprinciples.com forward slash stories. C.K. told me that his goal is to erase the word housewife from the dictionary and create 1,000 successful women entrepreneurs, 3,000 salons, and 50,000 jobs by December 31, 2017. Principle 8 Chunk It Down The secret of getting ahead is getting started. The secret of getting started is breaking your complex, overwhelming tasks into small, manageable tasks, and then starting on the first one. Mark Twain, celebrated American author and humorist. Sometimes our biggest life goals seem so overwhelming. We rarely see them as a series of small, achievable tasks. But in reality, breaking down a large goal into smaller tasks and accomplishing them one at a time is exactly how any big goal gets achieved. So after you have decided what you really want and have set measurable goals with specific deadlines, the next step is to determine all of the individual action steps you will need to take to accomplish your goal.
how to chunk it down. There are several ways to figure out the action steps you will need to take to accomplish any goal. One is to consult with people who have already done what you want to do and ask what steps they took. From their experience, they can give you all of the necessary steps, as well as advice on what pitfalls to avoid. Another way is to purchase a book, a manual, or an online course that outlines the process. Yet another way is to start from the end and look backward. You simply close your eyes and imagine that it's now the future and you have already achieved your goal. Then just look back and see what you had to do to get where you are now. What was the last thing you did? And then the thing before that. And then the thing before that. Until you arrive at the first action you had to start with. Remember that it is okay to not know how to do something. It's okay to ask for guidance and advice from those who do know. Sometimes you can get it free, and sometimes you have to pay for it. Get used to asking, Can you tell me how to... and... What would I have to do to... and... How did you... Keep researching and asking until you can create a realistic action plan that will get you from where you are to where you want to go. What will you need to do? How much money will you need to save or raise? What new skills will you need to learn? What resources will you need to mobilize? Who will you need to enroll in your vision? Who will you need to ask for assistance? What new disciplines or habits will you need to build into your life? A valuable technique for creating an action plan for your goals is called mind mapping. Use mind mapping. Mind mapping is a simple but powerful process for creating a detailed to-do list for achieving your goal. It lets you determine what information you'll need to gather, who you'll need to talk to, what small steps you'll need to take, how much money you'll need to earn or raise, which deadlines you'll need to meet, and so on, for each and every goal. When I began creating my first educational program, a breakthrough goal that led to extraordinary gains for me and my business. I used mind mapping to help me chunk down that very large goal into all the individual tasks I would need to complete in order to produce a finished album. For the best primer on mind mapping, see The Mind Map Book, Unlock Your Creativity, Boost Your Memory, Change Your Life, by Tony Buzon and Barry Buzon. The original mind map I created for my audio program is on page 91. To mind map your own goals, follow these steps as illustrated in the example. 1. Center Circle In the center circle, jot down the name of your stated goal. In this case, create an educational audio program. 2. Outside Circles Next, divide the goal into major categories of tasks you'll need to accomplish to achieve the greater goal. In this case, title, studio, topics, audience, and so on. 3. Spokes. Then draw spokes radiating outward from each mini-circle and label each one, such as write copy, color picture for back cover, and arrange lunch. On a separate line connected to the mini-circle, write every single step you'll need to take. Break down each one of the more detailed task spokes with action items to help you create your master to-do list. Next, make a daily to-do list. Once you've completed a mind map for your goal, convert all of the to-do items into daily action items by listing each one on your daily to-do lists and committing to a completion date for each one. Schedule them in the appropriate order into your calendar, then do whatever it takes to stay on schedule. Do first things first. The goal is to stay on schedule and complete the most important item first. In his excellent book, Eat That Frog, 21 Great Ways to Stop Procrastinating and Get More Done in Less Time, Brian Tracy reveals not just how to conquer procrastination, but also how to prioritize and complete all of your action items. In his unique system, Brian advises goal-setters to identify the one to five things you must accomplish on any given day, and then pick the one you absolutely must do first. 
this becomes your biggest and ugliest frog. If you know you have to eat a big ugly frog before the end of the day, you don't want to spend the whole day dreading eating it. The simplest thing is to eat it first and get it over with. He then suggests you accomplish that most important task first. In essence, eat that frog first. And by so doing, make the rest of your day much, much easier. It's a great strategy. But unfortunately, most of us leave the biggest and ugliest frog for last, hoping it will go away or somehow become easier. It never does. However, when you accomplish your toughest task early in the day, it sets the tone for the rest of your day. It creates momentum and builds your confidence, both of which move you farther and faster toward your goal. Plan your day the night before. One of the most powerful tools high achievers use for chunking things down, gaining control over their life, and increasing their productivity is to plan their next day the night before. There are two major reasons why this is such a powerful strategy for success. One, if you plan your day the night before, making a to-do list and spending a few minutes visualizing exactly how you want the day to go, your subconscious mind will work on these tasks all night long. You will think of creative ways to solve any problem, overcome any obstacle, and achieve your desired outcomes. And if we can believe some of the newer theories of quantum physics, it will also send out waves of energy that will attract the people and resources to you that are needed to accomplish your goals. 2. By creating your to-do list the night before, you can start your day running. You know exactly what you're going to do and in what order, and you've already pulled together any materials you need. If you have five telephone calls to make, you would have them written down in the order you plan to make them with the phone numbers next to the person's name and all the support materials at hand. By mid-morning, you would be way ahead of most people, who waste the first half of the day clearing their desk, making lists, finding necessary paperwork, in short, just getting ready to work. Use the Achievers Focusing System a valuable tool that will really keep you focused on achieving all of your goals in the seven areas we explained in your vision, see pages 38 and 39, is the Achievers Focusing System developed by Les Hewitt of the Achievers Coaching Program. It is a form you can use to plan and hold yourself accountable for 13 weeks of goals and action steps. You can download a copy of the form and instructions on how to use it for free at www.thesuccessprinciples.com Principle 9 Success Leaves Clues Long ago, I realized that success leaves clues, and that people who produce outstanding results do specific things to create those results. I believe that if I precisely duplicated the actions of others, I could reproduce the same quality of results that they had. Anthony Robbins author of Unlimited Power. One of the great things about living in today's world of abundance and opportunity is that almost everything you want to do has already been done by someone else. It doesn't matter whether it's losing weight, running a marathon, starting a business, becoming financially independent, triumphing over breast cancer, or hosting the perfect dinner party. Someone has already done it and left clues in the form of books, manuals, audio and video programs, university classes, online courses, seminars, and workshops. Who's already done what you want to do? If you want to retire a millionaire, for instance, there are hundreds of books, ranging from The Automatic Millionaire to The One Minute Millionaire, and workshops ranging from Harv Ecker's Millionaire Mind Intensive to Marshall Thurber and D.C. Cordova's Money and You. You can access an updated and ever-expanding list of these kinds of resources at www.thesuccessprinciples.com forward slash resources. If you want to have a better relationship with your spouse, you can read John Gray's Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus, attend a couples workshop, or take Gay and Katie Hendricks' Conscious Loving and Living Essentials Seminar. For virtually everything you want to do, there are books and courses on how to do it. Better yet, 
just a phone call away are people who've already successfully done what you want to do and who are available as teachers, facilitators, mentors, advisors, coaches, and consultants. Here are three ways you can begin to seek out clues. 1. Seek out a teacher, coach, mentor, a manual, book, audio program, or an Internet resource to help you achieve one of your major goals. 2. Seek out someone who has already done what you want to do and ask the person if you can interview him or her on how you should proceed. 3. Ask someone if you can shadow them for a day and watch them work, or offer to be a volunteer, assistant, or intern for someone you can learn from. Why People Don't Seek Out Clues When I was preparing to go on a morning news show in Dallas, I asked the station's makeup artist what her long-term goals were. She said she'd always thought about opening her own beauty salon, so I asked her what she was doing to make that happen. Nothing, she said, because I don't know how to go about it. I suggested she offer to take a salon owner to lunch and ask how she opened her own salon. You can do that, the makeup artist exclaimed. You most certainly can. In fact, you have probably thought about approaching an expert for advice, but rejected the idea with thoughts such as, Why would someone take the time to tell me what they did? Why would they teach me and create their own competition? Banish those thoughts. You will find that most people love to talk about how they built their business or accomplished their goals. But unfortunately, like the makeup artist in Dallas, most of us don't take advantage of all the resources available to us. Why? It never occurs to us. We don't see others using these resources, so we don't do it either. Our parents didn't do it. Our friends aren't doing it. Nobody where we work is doing it. It's inconvenient. We'd have to drive across town to a meeting. We'd have to take time away from television, family, or friends. Asking others for advice or information puts us up against our fear of rejection. We are afraid to take the risk. Connecting the dots in a new way would mean change, and change, even when it's in our best interest, is uncomfortable. Connecting the dots means hard work, and frankly, most people don't want to work that hard. Principle 10. Release the Brakes Everything you want is just outside your comfort zone. Robert Allen co-author of The One Minute Millionaire. Have you ever been driving your car and suddenly realized you've left the emergency brake on? Did you push down harder on the gas to overcome the drag of the brake? No, of course not. You simply released the brake. And with no extra effort, you started to go faster. Most people drive through life with their psychological emergency brake on. They hold on to negative images about themselves, or suffer the mental and emotional effects of powerful experiences they haven't yet resolved or released. They stay in a comfort zone entirely of their own making. They maintain inaccurate beliefs about reality, or harbor guilt and self-doubt. And when they try to achieve their goals, these negative images and pre-programmed comfort zones always cancel out their good intentions, no matter how hard they try. Successful people, on the other hand, have discovered that instead of using increased willpower as the engine to power their success, it's simply easier to release the brakes by letting go of and replacing their limiting beliefs, by changing their self-images, and by releasing negative emotions like fear, resentment, anger, guilt, and shame. Get out of your comfort zone. Think of your comfort zone as a prison you live in. A largely self-created prison. It consists of the collection of can'ts, musts, must-nots, and other unfounded beliefs formed from all the negative thoughts and decisions you have accumulated and reinforced during your lifetime. Perhaps you've even been trained to limit yourself. Don't be as dumb as an elephant. A baby elephant is trained at birth to be confined to a very small space. Its trainer will tie its leg with a rope to a wooden post planted deep in the ground. This confines the baby elephant to an area determined by the length of the rope, 
the elephant's comfort zone. Though the baby elephant will initially try to break the rope, the rope is too strong, and so the baby elephant learns that it can't break the rope. It learns that it has to stay in the area defined by the length of the rope. When the elephant grows up into a five-ton colossus that could easily break the same rope, it doesn't even try, because it learned as a baby that it couldn't break the rope. In this way, the largest elephant can be confined by the puniest little rope. Perhaps this also describes you, still trapped in a comfort zone by something as puny and weak as the small rope that controls the elephant, except your rope is made up of the limiting beliefs and images that you received and took on when you were young. If this describes you, the good news is that you can change your comfort zone. How? There are four different ways. One, you can use affirmations and positive self-talk to affirm already having what you want, doing what you want, and being the way you want. Two, you can create powerful and compelling new internal images of having, doing, and being what you want. Three, you can use the revolutionary technique called tapping therapy. Four, you can simply change your behavior. All four of these approaches will shift you out of your old comfort zone. Stop recreating the same experience over and over. An important concept that successful people understand is that you are never stuck. You just keep recreating the same experience over and over by thinking the same thoughts, maintaining the same beliefs, speaking the same words, and doing the same things. Too often we create an endless loop of reinforcing behavior, which keeps us trapped in a constant downward spiral. Our limiting thoughts create images in our mind, and those images govern our behavior, which in turn reinforces the limiting thought. Imagine thinking that you are going to forget your talking points when you have to give a presentation at work. The thought stimulates a picture of you forgetting a key point. The image creates an experience of fear. The fear clouds your clear thinking, which makes you forget one of your key points which reinforces your self-talk that you can't speak in front of groups. See, I knew I would forget what I was supposed to say. I can't speak in front of groups. As long as you keep complaining about your present circumstances, your mind will focus on it. By continually talking about, thinking about, and writing about the way things are, you are continually reinforcing those very same neural pathways in your brain that got you to where you are today and you are continually sending out the same vibrations that will keep attracting the same people and circumstances that you have already created. To change this cycle, you must focus instead on thinking, talking, and writing about the reality you want to create. You must flood your unconscious with thoughts and images of this new reality. The significant problems we face cannot be solved by the same level of thinking that created them. Albert Einstein Winner Nobel Prize for Physics What's your financial temperature? Your comfort zone works the same way the thermostat in your home works. When the temperature in the room approaches the edge of the thermal range you have set, the thermostat sends an electrical signal to the furnace or to the air conditioner to turn it on or off. As the temperature in the room begins to change, the electrical signals continue to respond to the changes and keep the temperature within the desired range. Similarly, you have an internal psychological thermostat that regulates your level of performance in the world. Instead of electrical signals, your internal performance regulator uses discomfort signals to keep you within your comfort zone. As your behavior or performance begins to approach the edge of that zone, you begin to feel uncomfortable. If what you are experiencing is outside the self-image you unconsciously hold, your body will send signals of mental tension and physical discomfort to your system. To avoid this discomfort, you unconsciously pull yourself back into your comfort zone. My stepfather, who was a regional sales manager for NCR, noticed that each of his salespeople had a self-image of themselves as a salesperson. They were a $2,000 a month salesperson or a $3,000 a month salesperson. If a person's self-image was that he earned $3,000 a month in commissions, then, whenever he earned that much in commissions in the first week of the month, 
he would slack off for the rest of the month. On the other hand, if it were near the end of the month and he had only earned $1,500 in commissions, he would put in 16-hour days, work weekends, create new sales proposals, and do everything possible to get to the $3,000 level for that month. No matter what the circumstance, a person with a $36,000 self-image would always produce a $36,000 income. To do anything else would make them uncomfortable. I remember one year my stepfather was out selling cash registers on New Year's Eve. He was out well past midnight with the intention of selling two more cash registers so that he would qualify for the annual trip to Hawaii awarded to all salesmen who hit their yearly quota. He had earned the trip for several years running, and his self-image would not allow him to lose out that year. He sold those machines and made the trip. It would have been outside his comfort zone to do anything less. Imagine the same scenario in relation to your savings account. Some people are comfortable as long as they have $2,000 in their savings account. Others are uncomfortable if they have any less than eight months' income salted away. Still others are comfortable with no savings and credit card debt of $25,000. If the person needing eight months' income and savings to feel comfortable is hit with an unexpected medical expense of $16,000, he will curtail his spending, work overtime, have a garage sale, whatever it takes to get his savings back up to the previous level. Likewise, if he suddenly inherits money, he is likely to spend enough of it to stay in that same savings comfort zone. No doubt you have heard that most lottery winners lose, spend, squander, or give away all of their newfound money within a few years of winning it. In fact, 80% of lottery winners in the United States file bankruptcy within five years. The reason is because they failed to develop a millionaire mindset. As a result, they subconsciously recreate the reality that matches their previous mindset. They feel uncomfortable with so much money, so they find some way to get back to their own familiar comfort zone. We have a similar comfort zone for the kinds of restaurants we eat in, the hotels we stay in, the kind of car we drive, the houses we live in, the clothes we wear, the vacations we take, and the type of people we associate with. If you have ever walked down Fifth Avenue in New York or Rodeo Drive in Beverly Hills, you have probably experienced walking into a store and immediately feeling as if you didn't belong there. The store was just too upscale for you you felt out of place. That's your comfort zone in operation. Change your behavior. When I first moved to Los Angeles, my new boss took me shopping for clothes at this very upscale men's shop in Westwood. The most I had previously ever paid for a dress shirt was $35 at Nordstrom. The cheapest shirt in this store was $95. I was stunned and broke out in a cold sweat. While my boss purchased many things that day, I bought one Italian designer shirt for $95. I was so far out of my comfort zone, I could hardly breathe. The next week, I wore the shirt and was amazed by how much better it fit, how much better it felt, and how much better I looked wearing it. After a couple more weeks of wearing it once a week, I really fell in love with it. Within a month, I bought another one. Within a year... Shirts like that were all I wore. Slowly, my comfort zone had changed because I'd gotten used to something better, even though it cost more. Today, I often pay $300 for custom-made shirts. When I was on the faculty of the Million Dollar Forum and Income Builders International, two organizations dedicated to teaching people how to become millionaires, all of the trainings were held at the Ritz-Carlton Hotel in Laguna Beach, California the Hilton Hotel on the Big Island of Hawaii, and other high-end luxury resort hotels. The reason was to get the participants used to being treated in a first-class way. It was part of stretching their comfort zones, changing the image of who they thought they were. Every training concluded with a black-tie dinner dance. For many of the participants, it was the first time they had ever attended a black-tie affair. Another comfort zone stretch. Change your self-talk with affirmations. I've always believed in magic. When I wasn't doing anything in this town, I'd go up every night, sit on Mulholland Drive, look out at the city, stretch out my arms and say, 
Everybody wants to work with me. I'm a really good actor. I have all kinds of great movie offers. I just repeat these things over and over, literally convincing myself that I had a couple of movies lined up. I drive down that hill ready to take the world on, going, movie offers are out there for me. I just don't hear them yet. It was like total affirmations, antidotes to the stuff that stems from my family background. Jim Carrey, actor. One way to stretch your comfort zone is to bombard your subconscious mind with new thoughts and images of a big bank account, a trim and healthy body, exciting work, interesting friends, memorable vacations, of all your goals as already complete. The technique you use to do this is called affirmations. An affirmation is a statement that describes a goal in its already completed state, such as, I am enjoying watching the sunset from the lanai of my beautiful beachfront condo on the Ka'anapali coast of Maui. Or, I am celebrating feeling light and alive at my perfect body weight of 135. The Nine Guidelines for Creating Effective Affirmations To be effective, your affirmations should be constructed using the following nine guidelines. 1. Start with the words, I am. The words, I am, are the two most powerful words in the language. The subconscious takes any sentence that starts with the words, I am, and interprets it as a command, a directive to make it happen. 2. Use the present tense. Describe what you want as though you already have it, as though it is already accomplished. Wrong. I am going to get a new red Porsche 911. Right. I am enjoying driving my new red Porsche 911. 3. State it in the positive. Affirm what you want, not what you don't want. State your affirmations in the positive. The unconscious does not hear the words no or not. This means that the statement, don't slam the door, is heard as, slam the door. The unconscious thinks in pictures, and the words, don't slam the door, evoke a picture of slamming the door. The phrase, I am no longer afraid of flying, evokes an image of being afraid of flying, while the phrase, I am enjoying the thrill of flying, evokes an image of enjoyment. Wrong. I am no longer afraid of flying. Right. I am enjoying the thrill of flying. 4. Keep it brief. Think of your affirmation as an advertising jingle. Act as if each word costs $1,000. It needs to be short enough and memorable enough to be easily remembered. 5. Make it specific. Vague affirmations produce vague results. Wrong. I am driving my new red sports car. Right. I am driving my new red Porsche 911. 6. Include an action word ending with ing. The active verb adds power to the effect by evoking an image of doing it right now. Wrong. I express myself openly and honestly. Right. I am confidently expressing myself openly and honestly. 7. Include at least one dynamic emotion or feeling word. Include the emotional state you would be feeling if you had already achieved the goal. Some commonly used words are enjoying, joyfully, happily, celebrating, proudly, calmly, peacefully, delighted, enthusiastic, lovingly, secure, serenely, and triumphant. Wrong. I am maintaining my perfect body weight of 178 pounds. Right. I am feeling agile and great at 178. Note that the last one has the ring of an advertising jingle. The subconscious loves rhythm and rhymes. 8. Make affirmations for yourself, not others. When you are constructing your affirmations, make them describe your behavior, not the behavior of others. Wrong. I am watching Johnny clean up his room. Right. I am effectively communicating my needs and desires to Johnny. 9. Add or something better. 
When you are affirming getting a specific situation, job, opportunity, vacation, material object, house, car, boat, or relationship, husband, wife, child, always add the words, or something, someone, better. Sometimes our criteria for what we want come from our ego or from our limited experience. Sometimes there is someone or something better that is available for us. So let your affirmations include this phrase when it is appropriate. Example. I am enjoying living in my beautiful beachfront villa on the Kaanapali coast of Maui, or somewhere better. How to Use Affirmations and Visualization 1. Review your affirmations one to three times a day. The best times are first thing in the morning, in the middle of the day to refocus yourself, and around bedtime. 2. If appropriate, read each affirmation out loud. 3. Close your eyes and visualize yourself as the affirmation describes. See it as if you were looking out at the scene from inside of yourself. In other words, don't see yourself standing out there in the scene. See the scene looking out through your eyes as if you were actually living it. 4. Hear any sounds you might hear when you successfully achieve what your affirmation describes. The sound of the surf, the roar of the crowd, the playing of the national anthem. Include other important people in your life congratulating you and telling you how pleased they are with your success. 5. Feel the feelings that you will feel when you achieve that success. The stronger the feelings, the more powerful the process. If you have difficulty creating the feelings, you can affirm, I am enjoying easily creating powerful feelings in my effective work with affirmations. 6. Say your affirmation again, and then repeat this process with the next affirmation. Other ways to use affirmations 1. Post 3x5 index cards with your affirmations around your home. 2. Hang pictures of the things you want around your house or your room. You can put a picture of yourself in the picture. 3. Repeat your affirmations during wasted time such as waiting in line, exercising, and driving. You can repeat them silently or out loud. 4. Record your affirmations and listen to them while you work, exercise, drive, or fall asleep. 5. Have one of your parents make a recording of encouraging things you would like to have heard from them when you were growing up, or words of encouragement and permission you would currently like to hear. 6. Repeat your affirmations in the first person, I am, second person, you are, and third person, he or she is, or your name is. 7. Put your affirmations on your screensaver on your computer, tablet, or smartphone, so you'll see them every time you use your computer. Affirmations work. I first learned about the power of affirmations in my twenties, when W. Clement Stone challenged me to set a goal that was so far beyond my current circumstances, it would literally astound me if I achieved it. Though I thought Stone's challenge had merit, I didn't really apply it to my life in a serious way until several years later when I decided to make the jump from earning $25,000 a year to making $100,000 or more. The first thing I did was to craft an affirmation after one I'd seen by Florence Scovel Shin. My affirmation was, God is my infinite supply, and large sums of money come to me quickly and easily under the grace of God for the highest good of all concerned. I am happily and easily earning, saving, and investing $100,000 a year. Next, I created a huge replica of a $100,000 bill, which I affixed to the ceiling above my bed. On awakening, I would see the bill, close my eyes, repeat my affirmation, and visualize what I would be enjoying if I were living a $100,000 a year lifestyle. I envisioned the house I would live in, the furnishings and artwork I would own, the car I would drive, and the vacations I would take. I also created the feelings I would experience once I had already attained that lifestyle. Soon, I awoke one morning with my first $100,000 idea. 
It occurred to me that if I could sell 400,000 copies of my book, 100 Ways to Enhance Self-Concept in the Classroom, on which I received a 25 cents per copy royalty, I would earn a $100,000 income. I added to my morning visualizations the image of my book flying off bookstore shelves and my publisher writing me a $100,000 check. Not long after, a freelance journalist approached me and wrote an article about my work for the National Enquirer. As a result, thousands of additional copies of my book were sold that month. Almost daily, more and more money-making ideas flowed into my mind. For instance, I took out small ads and sold the book on my own, making $3 per copy instead of just 25 cents. I started a mail-order catalog of mine and others' books on self-esteem and made even more money from these same buyers. The University of Massachusetts saw my catalog and invited me to sell books at a weekend conference, helping me generate more than $2,000 in two days and introducing me to another strategy for making $100,000 a year. At the same time I was visualizing greater book sales, I also got the idea to generate more income from my workshops and seminars. When I asked a friend who did similar work how I could charge higher fees, he revealed he was already charging more than double what I was being paid. With his encouragement, I tripled my speaking fee and discovered the schools that were hiring me to speak had budgets even higher than that. My affirmation was paying off big time. But if I hadn't set the goal to make $100,000 and been diligent about affirming and visualizing it, I never would have raised my speaking fees, started a mail-order bookstore, attended a major conference, or been interviewed for a major publication. As a result, my income that year skyrocketed from $25,000 to over $92,000. Of course, I missed my $100,000 goal by $8,000, but I can assure you, I wasn't depressed about it. On the contrary, I was ecstatic. I had almost quadrupled my income in less than one year, using the power of visualization and affirmations coupled with the willingness to act when I had an inspired idea. After our $92,000 year, my wife asked me, If affirmations worked for $100,000, do you think they would also work for $1 million? Using a new affirmation, I am happily depositing my million-dollar royalty check from my best-selling book, along with visualization. I achieved that goal, too and have continued to make one million dollars or more every year since. Don't wait thirty years to use this strategy. Joe Newberry heard me tell this story at a business networking breakfast in the 1980s, but he didn't get around to putting his own one hundred thousand dollar bill on the ceiling until thirty years later. It was June, and he was looking for ways to boost his income. When he saw me retell that story in the movie The Secret, he rushed home to put his own $100,000 bill above his bed, where he would see it each morning when he woke up. By September, people were calling to hire him as a consultant. Soon after, he was representing two recording labels and negotiating deals for major artists. And in January, he flew to New York to pitch Barnes & Noble, as one of dozens of other sales representatives pitching that day asking them to place an order for the recorded works he represented. After chatting pleasantly with the Barnes & Noble buyer about her kids and family, Joe watched in amazement as she pulled out the necessary paperwork and wrote him an order on the spot. It wasn't the modest order Joe had expected, however. As he headed for the elevator and looked at the paperwork in his hand, he quickly calculated his commissions on the far more substantial order she had written. To the penny, he had just earned $100,000. Principle 11 See what you want. Get what you see. Imagination is everything. It is the preview of life's coming attractions. Albert Einstein, winner, Nobel Prize for Physics. Visualization or the act of creating compelling and vivid pictures in your mind, may be the most underutilized success tool you possess 
because it greatly accelerates the achievement of any success in three powerful ways. 1. Visualization activates the creative powers of your subconscious mind. 2. Visualization focuses your brain by programming its reticular activating system, RAS, to notice available resources that were always there, but were previously unnoticed. 3. Visualization, through the law of attraction, magnetizes and attracts to you the people, resources, and opportunities you need to achieve your goal. The law of attraction basically states that whatever you think about, talk about, fantasize about, and feel strongly about, you will attract into your life. When you perform any task in real life, researchers have found your brain uses the same identical processes it would use if you were only vividly visualizing that activity. In other words, your brain sees no difference whatsoever between visualizing something and actually doing it. This principle also applies to learning anything new. Research at Harvard University found that students who visualized in advance performed tasks with nearly 100% accuracy, whereas students who didn't visualize achieved only 55% accuracy. Visualization simply makes the brain achieve more. And though none of us were ever taught this in school, sports psychologists and peak performance experts have been popularizing the power of visualization since the 1980s. Almost all Olympic and professional athletes now employ the power of visualization. Jack Nicklaus, the legendary golfer with 73 tournament victories and $5.7 million in winnings, once said, I never hit a shot, not even in practice, without having a very sharp, in-focus picture of it in my head. It's like a color movie. First, I see where I want it to finish, nice and white and sitting high on the bright green grass. Then the scene quickly changes, and I see the ball going there, its path, trajectory and shape, even its behavior on landing. Then there's sort of a fade-out, and the next scene shows me making the kind of swing that will turn the previous images into reality. How Visualization Works to Enhance Performance when you visualize your goals as already complete each and every day, it creates a conflict, structural tension in your subconscious mind between what you are visualizing and what you currently have. Your subconscious mind works to resolve that conflict by turning your current reality into the new, more exciting vision. This conflict, when intensified over time through constant visualization, actually causes three things to happen. One. It programs your brain's RAS to start letting into your awareness anything that will help you achieve your goals. 2. It activates your subconscious mind to create solutions for getting the goals you want. You'll start waking up in the morning with new ideas. You'll find yourself having ideas in the shower while you are taking long walks and while you are driving to work. 3. It creates new levels of motivation you'll start to notice you are unexpectedly doing things that take you to your goal. All of a sudden, you are raising your hand in class, volunteering to take on new assignments at work, speaking out at staff meetings, asking more directly for what you want, saving money for the things that you want, paying down a credit card debt, or taking more risks in your personal life. Let's take a closer look at how the RAS works. At any one time, there are about 11 million bits of information streaming into your brain, most of which you cannot attend to, nor do you need to. So your brain's RAS filters most of them out, letting into your awareness only those signals that can help you survive and achieve your most important goals. So how does your RAS know what to let into your awareness and what to filter out? It lets in anything that will help you achieve the goals you have set, and are constantly visualizing and affirming. It also lets in anything that matches your beliefs and images about yourself, others, and the world. The RAS is a powerful tool, but it can only look for ways to achieve the exact pictures you give it. Your creative subconscious doesn't think in words. It thinks in pictures. So how does all this help your effort to become successful and achieve the life of your dreams?
When you give your brain specific, colorful, and vividly compelling pictures to manifest, it will seek out and capture all the information necessary to bring that picture into reality for you. If you give your mind a $10,000 problem, it will come up with a $10,000 solution. If you give your mind a $1 million problem, it'll come up with a $1 million solution. If you give it pictures of a beautiful home, an adoring spouse, an exciting career, and exotic vacations, it will go to work on achieving those. By contrast, if you are constantly feeding it negative, fearful, and anxious pictures, guess what? It'll go to work to achieve those, too. The Process for Visualizing Your Future The process of visualizing for success is really quite simple. All you have to do is close your eyes and see your goals as already complete. If one of your objectives is to own a nice house on the lake, then close your eyes and see yourself walking through the exact house you would like to own. Fill in all of the details. What does the exterior look like? How is it landscaped? What kind of view does it have? What do the living room, kitchen, master bedroom, dining room, family room, and den look like? How is it furnished? Go from room to room and fill in all of the details. Make the images as clear and bright as possible. This goes for any goal you make, whether it is in the area of work, play, family, personal finances, relationships, or philanthropy. Write down each of your goals and objectives, then review them. Affirm them and visualize them every day. Then, each morning when you wake and each night before you go to bed, read through the list of goals out loud, pausing after each one to close your eyes and recreate the visual image of that completed goal in your mind. Continue through the list until you have visualized each goal as complete and fulfilled. The whole process will take between 10 and 15 minutes, depending on how many goals you have. If you meditate, do your visualization right after you finish meditating. The deepened state you have achieved in meditation will heighten the impact of your visualizations. Adding sounds and feelings to the pictures To multiply the effect many times over, add sound, smells, tastes, and feelings to your pictures. What sounds would you be hearing? What smells would you be smelling? What tastes would you be tasting? And most important, what emotions and bodily sensations would you be feeling if you had already achieved your goal? If you were imagining your dream house on the beach, you might add in the sound of the surf lapping at the shore outside your home, the sound of your kids playing on the sand, and the sound of your spouse's voice thanking you for being such a good provider. Then add in the feeling of pride of ownership, satisfaction at having achieved your goal, and the feeling of the sun on your face as you sit on your deck looking out at a beautiful sunset over the ocean. Fuel the images with emotion. By far, these emotions are what propel your vision forward. Researchers know that when accompanied by intense emotions, an image or scene can stay locked in the memory forever. I'm sure you remember exactly where you were when the World Trade Center collapsed on September 11, 2001. Your brain remembers it all in great detail, because not only did your brain filter information you needed for survival under these tense moments, but also the images themselves were created with intense emotion. These intense emotions actually stimulate the growth of additional spiny protuberances on the dendrites of brain neurons which ultimately creates more neural connections, thus locking in the memory much more solidly. You can bring the same emotional intensity to your own visualizations by adding inspiring music, real-life smells, deeply felt passion, even loudly shouting your affirmations with exaggerated enthusiasm. The more passion, excitement, and energy you can muster, the more powerful will be the ultimate result. Visualization Works Olympic gold medalist Peter Vidmar describes his use of visualization in his successful pursuit of the gold. To keep us focused on our Olympic goal, we began ending our workouts by visualizing our dream. We visualized ourselves actually competing in the Olympics, 
and achieving our dream by practicing what we thought would be the ultimate gymnastic scenario. I'd say, Okay, Tim, let's imagine it's the men's gymnastics team finals of the Olympic Games. The United States team is on its last event of the night, which just happens to be the high bar. The last two guys up for the United States are Tim Daggett and Peter Vidmar. Our team is neck and neck with the People's Republic of China, the reigning world champions, and we have to perform our routines perfectly to win the Olympic team gold medal. At that point, we'd each be thinking, Yeah, right. We're never going to be neck and neck with those guys. They were number one at the Budapest World Championships, while our team didn't even win a medal. It's never going to happen. But what if it did happen? How would we feel? We'd close our eyes and, in this empty gym at the end of a long day, we'd visualize an Olympic arena with 13,000 people in the seats and another 200 million watching live on television. Then we'd practice our routines. First, I'd be the announcer. I'd cup my hands around my mouth and say, Next up, from the United States of America, Tim Daggett. Then Tim would go through his routine as if it were the real thing. Then Tim would go over to the corner of the gym, cup his hands around his mouth, and in his best announcer voice say, Next up, from the United States of America, Peter Vidmar. Then it was my turn. In my mind, I had one chance to perfectly perform my routine in order for our team to win the gold medal. If I didn't, we'd lose. Tim would shout out, Green light! And I'd look at the superior judge, who was usually our coach, Mako. I'd raise my hand and he'd raise his right back. Then I'd turn, face the bar, grab hold, and begin my routine. Well... A funny thing happened on July 31st, 1984. It was the Olympic Games men's gymnastics team finals in Pauley Pavilion on the UCLA campus. The 13,000 seats were all filled, and a television audience in excess of 200 million around the world tuned in. The United States team was on its last event of the night, the high bar. The last two guys up for the United States just happened to be Tim Daggett and Peter Vidmar. And just as we visualized, our team was neck and neck with the People's Republic of China. We had to perform our high bar routines perfectly to win the gold medal. I looked at Coach Mako, my coach for the past 12 years. As focused as ever, he simply said, Okay, Peter, let's go. You know what to do. You've done it a thousand times, just like every day back in the gym. Let's just do it one more time and let's go home. You're prepared. He was right. I had planned for this moment and visualized it hundreds of times. I was prepared to perform my routine. Rather than seeing myself actually standing in the Olympic arena with 13,000 people in the stands and 200 million watching on television, in my mind I pictured myself back in the UCLA gym at the end of the day with two people left in the gym. When the announcer said, From the United States of America, Peter Vidmar. I imagined it was my buddy Tim Daggett saying it. When the green light came on, indicating it was time for the routine, I imagined that it wasn't really a green light, but that it was Tim shouting, Green light! And when I raised my hand toward the superior judge from East Germany, in my mind I was signaling my coach, just like I had signaled him every day at the end of hundreds of workouts. In the gym, I always visualized I was at the Olympic finals. At the Olympic finals, I visualized I was back in the gym. I turned, faced the bar, jumped up, and grabbed on. I began the same routine I had visualized and practiced day after day in the gym. I was in memory mode, going yet again where I'd already gone hundreds of times. I quickly made it past the risky double-release move that had harpooned my chances at the World Championships. I moved smoothly through the rest of my routine and landed a solid dismount where I anxiously waited for my score from the judges. With a deep voice, the announcement came through the speaker. The score for Peter Vidmar is 9.95. Yes, I shouted. I did it. The crowd cheered loudly as my teammates and I celebrated our victory. Thirty minutes later, we were standing on the Olympic medal platform in the Olympic arena with 13,000 people in the stands and over 200 million watching on television 
while the gold medals were officially draped around our necks. Tim, me, and our teammates stood proudly wearing our gold medals as the national anthem played and the American flag was raised to the top of the arena. It was a moment we visualized and practiced hundreds of times in the gym. Only this time, it was for real.